The League of Women Voters, Metro North Chamber of Commerce, and North Suburban Optimists welcomes you to meet the candidates for those running for State House 41B. District 41B comprises all of Columbia Heights and Hilltop and portions of St. Anthony Village in New Brighton. Thanks to the candidates in the City of Columbia Heights Communications and Events Department making this event possible. This year, LWV is holding our Meet the Candidates forums without an audience to avoid COVID-19 spread. Look for upcoming forums at our website, lwvabcmn.org and select the Meet the Candidates option found on the left-hand side of the webpage. This is also the site where you can submit questions to the upcoming forms. I'm Karen Varian, train moderator for the Anoka, Blaine, Coon Rapids area League of Women Voters. Because I live in Blaine, I can't vote for these candidates and I'm not acquainted with either of them. All candidates for this race were invited to participate in the form. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose any political parties or candidates for office. These candidates care very much whom, they, whom you vote for, but the League does not. The League does hope that each of you will vote. The goal of our forms is to help citizens become informed voters. The candidates for State House 41B are Sandra Feist and Ronald Ray Vogel. The term of office for a state representative is two years. We will begin with three questions which were provided to the candidates in advance. This will be followed by questions that have been submitted earlier from the public through the LWV ABC website. We had more submitted questions than can be asked in this form. Candidates will alternate who answers each question first. Answers are limited to one minute. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, so I am an immigration attorney, a small business owner. Uh, I just celebrated my 10th anniversary of the law firm that I co-founded. Uh, I have two children, ages eight and 10. They go to public schools in the Mounds View School District. Uh, and I've been deeply involved with community since we moved to the district six years ago. Uh, I'm on the leadership team with my kids' Cub Scouts pack. And uh, for the last several years, I've helped plan the Pinewood Derby. Uh, I also have been uh, helpful in organizing our national night out. So um, I, I'm just very excited for the opportunity to um, potentially be the next legislator for our district and to um, express the values that, that my community uh, holds and, and that I share. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today and I'm excited to share more about my background. Thank you. Okay, so I'm happy to be here and tell about myself, and I'm going to read this to try and get, get it all in. I was born in Minnesota. I will be 66 in October. I grew up in a poor family as my father was disabled from the time I was born. I have a little Oneida tribe heritage. I also have Cherokee, Hispanic, and Black relatives. I am married to a woman from Honduras. My wife's name is Lucia Vogel, and she's running for um, the uh, Senate for 41 and I am a CNC machinist, and I was self-taught by reading the book, and they, they were amazed that I did it, and they gave me the job, and I'm still doing it. I have attended the Columbia Heights City Council meetings at various times. I have volunteered with the police as a block leader in the past in the National Night Out, and I've organized many chess tournaments in Columbia Heights Public Library, and uh, Patchy Plaza, and various other, preferably library, I am a conservative Republican. I have lived about 31 years in this district. I have some, some college education. I was going to college and working at the same time, and I decided I want to be a machinist. I, I have been a board member of 501c3 C3 organizations. I have helped people in the past with their problems when I was able to. In fact, one time I wrote a court brief for a public defender by which the judge dismissed the case based on my brief, and I will help people as I can so as a lawyer, I know the real world impact of laws on people's lives and on businesses. And I look forward to bringing that uh, expertise to the role of legislator. Uh, as a small business owner, I know about strategic investments and I am extremely excited to invest in our district and in our state. 
Uh, as a, an immigration lawyer, I feel like I bring a blend of advocacy skills and empathy, as well as uh, an expertise in a very technical area of law. So again, I'm just very excited to bring that expertise in how the law impacts real people's lives and really impacts the businesses and the local community. Uh, I'm just extremely excited to bring my kind of perspective from my career as a mother of two uh, and from my community involvement uh, to the role of legislator. And I feel like I can help to shape very uh, effective policies with an understanding of how they will impact the community. So in terms of long-term goals, uh, I would like to invest in our roads and public transit. I think it's extremely important to invest in our infrastructure to encourage business development, which will help with the tax base and quality of life, uh, and also to ensure that we have safe roads and a safe community. I'm also very excited to invest in our public schools. We need to make sure that our funding is equitable, generous, and consistent. Uh, that's really important at the state level so that we don't uh, impose burdensome levies on local communities. Uh, so those are two of my long-term plans. In terms of my short-term plans, uh, I am running for office because I want to be a voice for an inclusive and equitable community. I want to meet with the community and make sure that everyone uh, has their voice heard. Uh, we have this rich diversity, in particular in Columbia Heights, uh, with the Somali, Tibetan, Native American, and African American communities, and I just want to make sure that everyone feels included and welcome and that they have a voice. Thank you. My short and long-term goals would be jobs, jobs, and more jobs. And I would like, like a community outreach program held at churches and schools for the people to meet with and discuss things with the police, kind of like the Coffee with a Cop program, but extended out more to the community, other places. I would like to see a small shopping mall developed in Columbia Heights and a community center that can be shared by children and adults. And again, jobs, jobs, jobs. But regarding roads, I would like to see our roads that are being built, worked on, finished instead of being continuously being there. Nobody's work. I drive by, there's nobody working. The machines sit there. I want to get these things completed. Number one, if governor still has emergency powers, vote to remove those. That's my number one issue. Number two, again, jobs, 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 and more jobs. Uh, business development, uh, help those businesses that have not re reopened, help some some way with low interest loans, do what I can to help our community and whatever I can, and that's my, my goal. So the next legislative session is going to be extremely challenging because we have a huge budgetary challenges due to the decrease in taxes, uh, due to COVID and the increased expenses. And our budget is a moral document and we need to make sure that we are investing in what is most important. And we need to have those hard conversations and negotiations. And we need to come to a place where we can support Minnesotans. Uh, that means ensuring that we have unemployment benefits that can support out of work Minnesotans. Uh, that means that we are supporting our schools, including addressing uh, shortfalls, uh, shortcomings that are no one's fault. Uh, but we need to address the uh, equity issues with uh, what, what um, has gone on with our schooling as a result of COVID. Uh, and with respect to the emergency powers, every single state has uh, a governor who is exercising those emergency powers as well as our president. And it's important to ensure that the uh, legislature and the governor can work together uh, to, to address the pandemic and to address the crisis in a collaborative way. Thank you. Well, I hope we'll have passed one by then, but assuming that we haven't, I very much do. Um, you know, uh, as, as uh, Ronald said, we need to focus on job creation, we need to focus on economic development, and the bonding bill is a huge part of that. If we're investing in infrastructure, that means we're investing in jobs. And if we can look at our bonding bill as an opportunity to invest in green jobs uh, and renewable energy jobs, that's a way to also address environmental factors. Uh, the bonding bill is an important tool that the legislature and the governor have uh, to, to ensure that we are meeting the needs of our state. Uh, that means infrastructure, that means looking at environmental factors, it means you know, funding the aspect of our state operations that we need to fund. And so uh, I am very much in support of passing a robust bonding bill. Thank you. With a five plus billion dollar deficit for the state of Minnesota, 
I would say we have to have a bonding bill to pay for our expenses, but it needs to be really controlled. And I am favor a lot of uh, cutting non-essential expenses the state currently spends, and we need to stop the waste. Well, as I said, I, for at least Columbia Heights, we, there's nothing much for the kids to, to do. Uh, so I'd like to have a community center here in Columbia Heights with the kids and adults both sharing it. And there's other areas that don't have much for kids to do. And it doesn't take a huge building to make some area access so that when it's winter time, kids can go and play basketball and things together. And I have talked chess to many kids in, in schools and libraries and that in the past. And chess would be a very easy thing to do in a room. You don't have to have any equipment other than tables and chairs. So one of the main reasons I'm running for office is because I want to see us fully fund our schools. Uh, equal access to a quality education is the most important thing that we can do as a state. And so I, I see that as a priority for our youth. And that in particular is a huge priority right now because we have seen the pandemic really upend those school-based supports that kids need. And so if we're providing that funding where it needs to be and in an equitable way, that will go a long way to supporting the youth in Anoka County uh, and in our district. Um, so I agree that it would be wonderful to fund more resources for community um, community centers where, where children can get together and have planned activities. And you know anything we can do to support our youth is something that we're doing that is not just out of the goodness of our heart, it is also a workforce development investment uh, in the future of our state. So I'm a small business owner. I founded, uh, co-founded my law firm 10 years ago this month. I currently have eight employees and it's been a huge and rewarding challenge. Uh, it has involved strategic investment, strategic hiring. It has involved diversity and inclusion, um, looking at my hiring practices and making sure that we're giving opportunities to you know, all communities. Uh, it's involved looking at making sure that my workers are paid fairly, I would, I would like to say generously, um, and given the benefits that they deserve uh, and that all workers deserve. So it's given me a lot of perspective on how to make thoughtful investments. And what I have found is that if I invest in my workforce and if I invest in my business and I take those risks, that it has come back to me tenfold. Uh, and so it's really formed my philosophy of spending, which is to be strategic, be comfortable with taking some risks and to you know, be generous in investing in that business and in the future. I have been involved in a business. My wife used to have a restaurant in Columbia Heights called Catalina's Restaurant. In 2011, I helped with purchasing of equipment, finding the equipment and getting it into the building and contractors. And I have done taxes for the business and many, many things, you know, chairs, tables, whatever. And I, and I also organize the, uh, the, the Anoka County Health Department was giving us problems for opening and I was a negotiator and they backed down and they gave my wife permission to open up because they were wrong. And it finally admitted it and says, go ahead, open up. And I understand how difficult it is for businesses to tr comply with many things that the, the state, the, the county doesn't really need. Decrease some of the requirements for business to open, make it easier. There's too many government regulations and uh, make the fees cheaper, the, the, the application fee for opening a business when they're first starting out, make it, make it less. And uh, we should have business loans with low income interest because like when my wife opened her business, it was, they had to pay all cash because they didn't have any loans. So I agree that sometimes licensure can be extremely burdensome and uh, create barriers to entrepreneurs. And so I definitely think that we need to be thinking about that. We also need to be thinking about our healthcare system, which right now ties uh, health insurance to uh, a job. 
And I know that myself, when I went out on my own, it was a huge decision uh, that related to my health care, and that was a huge risk. And so if anything we can do that will ensure that everyone has access to health care uh, will allow everyone who has entrepreneurial dreams to, to take that step as I did. Um, in addition, I uh, think we need to support workers' rights. Uh, you know, when workers are paid fairly, given the benefits that they need, um, including sick and safe leave, uh, then we have a robust economy and we have uh, companies that can thrive along with their workers. And yeah, so let's do those things. Um, so, you know, um, we all need to take the steps that we can individually to mitigate risk, um, including wearing masks in public and, um, you know, being thoughtful in, in the groups, uh, the sizes of groups that we go in. Um, in terms of what the state can do, I do think that we need to be very strategic in looking at the COVID levels and which businesses we allow to remain open and how we allow them to remain open. But I do think that we need to be very thoughtful about quality of life and what we need as humans to survive and thrive even in the time of COVID. And so as we're looking at risk, we need to take both an epidemiology epidemiological uh, perspective as well as an emotional social perspective uh, and an economic perspective and kind of balance all of those. And I don't think there's a right answer, but I think we need to be thoughtful and collaborative and continue to adapt as necessary. People, please wear a mask because it upsets other people if you don't wear them that they want you to wear the mask. Regarding the mandate, I see in stores many workers not wearing masks and they get, get around with doing that and nobody bothers them. I see people going in and out of stores, some wear a mask, some not. It doesn't work if everybody doesn't wear a mask, but if, if people in the store don't wear a mask, how do they expect people that come in the store to wear a mask? We need to have more businesses. We need to have more jobs, taxes paid by, the, not, not increased taxes, but taxes paid by the people for their income taxes within the state, that, that without all these businesses open, the government has less money for income. We need to have more businesses, more jobs, period. I do agree that we need to support business growth, and that is an important source of revenue, but I do not agree that we should not increase taxes. I believe that a progressive taxation system is what has made Minnesota a very hospitable environment for businesses and for its residents. And we need to take a look at those budget deficits and be thoughtful and strategic in the taxes that we raise and who we raise them from. Uh, if we were to cut services and benefits, uh, that would have a greater detrimental effect on the economy than if we were to tax people at the upper echelon of the income uh, who uh, can afford it and are not living paycheck to paycheck. And so that's what I would support. Uh, as I said before, the budget is a moral document and we need to fund our values. I don't think there is one single answer to this. Um, one thing that we do need to do is find a way to fund unemployment insurance so that people who are unemployed due to COVID uh, do not become homeless, which is a public health issue as well as a humanitarian issue, um, while they are unable to work. So we need to look at supporting families right now. Um, we also need to look at you know, supporting employers so that they can bring people back onto payroll or keep them on payroll during these tough times. Uh, we need to be supporting uh, business development uh, and workers, um, you know, and uh, we need to be also thinking long term. So as we're looking at the short term, we're supporting people so that they don't become homeless, so that, you know, workers are able to get back into the workforce. Uh, we need to support childcare. Uh, that is a huge issue as a mom of two. I can tell you that's a huge issue for the workforce right now. Um, so I just think we need to be looking at, you know, supporting businesses, workers, and families. People that have, are on unemployment, yes, extensions need to be granted for extended unemployment. Where the money comes, that's some of it's from the federal government, but the state has to come up with money too. And uh, the governor's mandates for 
people going into businesses, what businesses can do, has caused a lot of, a lot of the businesses to close. That hurts the state for income. That hurts the people that are working. They're losing their jobs. Where I work, we've had to cut our whole third shift because other companies that order from, from our company, they're not busy like they were before. A whole third shift. If, that, if that's in my company, it's gotta be a lot of other companies too. We need, we need to do something for the people. There is some and there is not in other instances. It all depends on the instances that we refer to. We need to look at each one separately and decide on each one separately. So I don't know if I understand the question completely, but I will answer the question of whether there is institutional racism everywhere. And I would say, yes, systemic inequities permeate every aspect of society, and we need to address it. Uh, most recently here in Minnesota, we have seen uh, the police murder George Floyd, and we've seen the Black Lives Matter movement uh, really swell and including support for that movement and then understanding that racial inequity in society is a huge pervasive problem and it is an urgent problem. Uh, so I very much believe that we need to address racial inequities uh, in employment, in policing, at the state level, at the state government level. Uh, we need to make sure that the voices of the communities in Minnesota are reflected in the legislature. Uh, and we need to make sure that legislators uh, are going to those communities and hearing them. Uh, here in Columbia Heights, uh, the Heights Next held a conversations on race and racism. And those types of initiatives are really wonderful to see and extremely important. Yes, I do. I am a former board member of the ACLU of Minnesota and the ACLU of Minnesota uh, focuses on this issue among others. Uh, my husband is the current programs director for the ACLU of Minnesota. So these issues of racial justice in our legal system are just a big part of our household. It's our small talk. It's a big part of what we care about and why we, we are in the community trying to fight for change. Um, so, you know, we need to be looking at bail reform. We need to be looking at police reform. Uh, we need to be looking at potentially marijuana legalization. We need to be looking at how we enforce our laws. And, and we need to really search our souls as to why uh, different communities have an entirely different experience with our criminal legal system. Here in Columbia Heights, I've, I've met many of the police and I don't see them having any problems with racial problems with the, with the people. They, they, they try to reach out to the community with their uh, coffee with a cup, cup of coffee with the police and the, as, as, far, as far as the justice system goes, yes, there may be some instances that there's a racial problem, but I, as, as I believe that most time in our courts, it should be a fair system for all people. If it's not, then, then there's a problem and we need to address it. The, the police reforms can, can only be effective as, as far as the people that control the the, the things that were passed um, enforce those things. Uh, so we've had many times where police have been uh, accused of certain things in, within police precincts. In the case of George Floyd, that police officer, I heard many complaints about him, but he was still allowed to continue, continue, continue. We need to have those people that are viewing the people that have the complaints about them, they need to be reviewed and see what is their problem that they don't take action. Can you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. I sure. wanted to answer it precisely. Do you think the statewide police reforms passed by the legislature this summer are moving Minnesota in the right direction? Explain. Thank you. Yes, I do think that the police accountability uh, measures that were passed this summer are moving Minnesota in the right direction. However, we have a long way to go. Um, some of the measures that I would like to see are uh, more of a reform on the post board, which oversees the licensure of police. I would also like to see an independent prosecutor, uh, and I would like to see more training uh, around disabilities and, and racial sensitivity. Um, and, you know, there is a lot we can do. Uh, we should get rid of warrior training. Uh, but I have been gratified to see the incredible work of the legislature over the summer, uh, led by the Posse Caucus. 
uh, to enact some important first steps in the right direction when it comes to police reform. And it looks like I have a 50 more seconds, so I will just also say I would also like to see us kind of reflect on how we fund policing and look at ways that we can perhaps uh, fund social services to address some of the areas where police are involved where they don't necessarily need to be involved. I feel very strongly about this issue. We absolutely need to restore these people's right to vote. Uh, this should be a nonpartisan or bipartisan issue. Uh, the people uh, who would be re-enfranchised uh, do not lean towards one party or the other. Uh, a lot of them are from greater Minnesota, and I believe it's like 58,000 people. It's a huge number of people um, who can be brought back into the system. And when you have the right to vote, you feel like you are part of the system. Uh, people who have the right to vote are much less likely to recidivate. Uh, and to um, get back into that uh, criminal system. Uh, so I absolutely believe that everyone uh, in Minnesota should have the right to vote, and especially people who have already served their time, they are out in our communities, and they absolutely should have the right to vote, and we should make sure that they know it once they do. The laws were passed long ago that they are not given the right to vote, and I will not go against those laws that have been passed. I do, I'm not currently familiar with how they do that, uh, there's, so I cannot really comment too much about it. It, it. They keep on changing it over and over again. Why it keeps on changing, I have no idea. I would think that once it gets made, to stick to that and keep and stop changing the borders. So, so the way that it works currently is that we usually fight about it between the parties and then it goes to the courts. And so I would support an independent civilian panel that uh, would be nonpartisan, that could uh, redistrict the state every 10 years so that it is not a partisan issue. Uh, gerrymandering is a huge issue uh, and it disenfranchises and minimizes the, vo the voices of many people in our state and in our country. And if we can find a, an independent nonpartisan way to draw our, uh, our lines um, in our districts, I think that would be a huge step in a very positive direction for our democracy. Yep. I'm strongly in favor of ranked choice voting. Uh, before I became a candidate, I was generally aware of it. I knew that a lot of people supported it and that it was kind of a more nuanced, inclusive method of voting. Uh, but I had a personal experience with it uh, during the endorsement. Uh, by the DFL. Uh, there were a number of really wonderful candidates uh, and we were all vying for the endorsement. And when COVID-19 forced us to cancel the convention, we proceeded with a ranked choice ballot. And the process was uh, wonderful. It, it created a really positive kind of atmosphere between the candidates because if somebody supported another candidate, we would still be looking to be their second choice or even third choice. Uh, it was a way for everyone to feel um, that they got to know all of the candidates, and I just really think that ranked choice voting is the future. I am against ranked choice voting, period. It, I'm going to say it all depends on what they, they have on these people, because there are certain people that somebody says, oh, they're at risk. Well, just because someone says to the police that person's a risky person doesn't mean they should be have their weapon confiscated. So it has to be looked at individually in each case, and someone has to make a decision, not just make it totally one way. I support common sense gun violence prevention laws, including background checks and red flag laws. Uh, I will never forget uh, the day of the Sandy Hook shooting. Uh, my son was a baby and he was in daycare across the street from my office and I had to leave the office to be with him. I was so overcome by the tragedy. And I just feel like we have a problem in this country and there is something we can do about it. And we can start by looking at background checks that make sense uh, to look at people who we are giving deadly weapons. Uh, and we can also look at red flag laws. We can look at people who have, uh, you know, restraining orders against them or convictions for domestic violence. Uh, you know, gun deaths are a huge issue with suicide prevention. Um, I believe that over 50% of the gun deaths in Minnesota in the past year were by suicide. So this is a mental health issue as well. And I strongly support common sense gun violence, gun violence prevention measures. That's an interesting question. 
I feel like the general, um, the needs of marginalized communities are, are the same, are universal. Uh, everyone needs quality education. Uh, everyone needs to feel that they are included and welcomed, that their voice is heard. Uh, so in that way, I would feel that, you know, Minneapolis and Columbia Heights, you know, people who feel that they are marginalized, like they have that in common. Um, in terms of what we are doing here in Columbia Heights, uh, you know, Heights Next has been really at the vanguard, if that's the right word, the forefront of, you know, reaching out to all communities. Uh, we had our Pride Festival, um, the community garden uh, is a way that people can really come together in a very kind of natural way that different communities can really feel included and welcome and, and be side by side, you know, working and playing together. Uh, so, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot we can do. The conversations on race and racism are another example of ways that we are trying to make sure that everyone's voice is heard. Uh, this is why I'm running for office, to make sure that everyone feels included. Well, as a person that has a little um, Oneida ancestry and uh, Cherokee and Hispanic and black relatives, I say we all need to work together to, to make our community a good community to live in. And a good community to live in needs to be a lawful community. We need to enforce all the laws Unfortunately, in Minneapolis, the laws have not been enforced good, and there is a problem. I don't want what's happening in Minneapolis area to be happening in Columbia Heights. And fortunately, it has not got to that point yet. But yes, we all need to work together. We all need to live together and be good to each other as, as good Christians. I am a conservative Republican. And if I am elected, I, I pledge to vote. If the governor still has his own emergency power to remove that so that the House, the Senate, and the governor all work together as one unit and not just one person having con complete control. And I will vote to remove any non-essential spending that the state has. There's, there's many things that they waste money on uh, I will do what I can to promote businesses, jobs, and I'm just asking for everyone to give me your vote, and it's time for a change. The Democrats have had the control of the state how many years? It's time for a change. Thank you. Um, so I'm running for office to make sure that Minnesota is a place that uh, everyone has opportunities and all feel welcome. Uh, this is, at, you know, this is what called me to office uh, as an immigration attorney, a mother of two, a small business owner, uh, and a resident in our district for the past six years. I just feel that I can come into office and represent the values of this district. Uh, I'm excited to bring my technical skill, my energy, my compassion, uh, and my just work ethic. Uh, I always say that moms know how to multitask, um, so I plan to get stuff done. Uh, I'm really excited by this opportunity. I've, I've just um, felt so, so I've learned so much and I've felt so challenged and so inspired. And I'm just really excited uh, to be seeking office and seeking uh, votes in our district. Thank you so much. Thank you candidates for speaking to voters about issues and for running for State House Representative District 41B. Thanks viewers for your interest in becoming informed voters. As we move through this election season, you will find information and links to upcoming and recorded Meet the Candidates forms for local offices organized by LWV ABC. You can find them on our LWV ABC website. Each voter has several convenient methods to vote. You may request an absentee ball ballot to mail by accessing either the state Secretary of State's website or the website mnvotes.org. Additionally, you can vote early in person starting September 18th at City Hall or the Anoka County Elections Office. If you need to register to vote or update your registration, you can do that online or when you go to vote, including on election day. Make your voice heard in the, and in the general election by voting by or on November 3rd. 
Thank you and stay healthy and safe.